a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from the UOC. She has a Bachelor in Community Rehabilitation from the UOC. She has a Master's of Environmental Design from the UOC. She's the President of the Board of Directors for her co-op, the Art and Space Building. She's the Chair of the Children's Ability Fund. She's the Chair of Aging in Place Committee. She's also the Director of the National Age in Place Committee. She's also the Chair of the Universal uh, Design Standard Certification Project, which is a, an international body. And uh, I don't know what else can we say about Lenny. <laughs> um, we look forward to the things that she has to, to say. And without further ado, I'll turn the time over to Lenny. So. Trouble with the curve. And I have to say that when Matt first approached me, I, he just said just whatever you want to talk about. Don't do that to me. <laughs> um, so I decided on this topic from one of the movies that I really enjoy. So has anyone seen the movie Trouble with the Curb? And that's about um, a batter who thought he was all great and everything, but when it came to hitting a curveball, he couldn't do it. And baseball scouts call that trouble with the curb, or curve. I've decided to play on that and call it trouble with the curb. Having a disability, curbs are a problem. It's all about people having difficulties with the physical, the emotional, the social, and the cultural stuff, and the attitudinal things. Those are all obstacles to people with disabilities. So, what is disability? Disability, is it this? You see all these little signs everywhere? You've got graphic symbols of people in wheelchairs, you've got graphic symbols of people using canes. Or is it this? Is it all about um, the medical, the mental, the insurance? Or is it even this? Is it trauma? Is it something that tragic has to happen or to take place? Well, I'm here to tell you because we don't go around begging, we don't go around asking for anything. I saw these cats in Istanbul begging. Um, so you're eating at restaurants, so, but we don't, we don't, right? This is not what disability is all about. We're, we're not asking for you to give us anything. Or at least I'm not. Um, so managing disability in a world that often handicaps people with disabilities. And so I'm here today to ask you to be a little empathetic as I continue with this. Empathy is the word of the day. We're talking about managing disability and what it's going to require. It requires planning or time management. And I like to think that I'm great at time management because that's what my life is all about. Is it something that I want to do? Is it something that I can do? Well, anything that I plan is going to depend on my time and my energy. It's going to tell me as to whether or not I'm going to have any dignity or independence in any of this. And I do this 24-7. It's very exhausting, it's tiring, but it's something that has to happen. And whatever it is, whatever the rewards are going to be, whether they're awesome or not, that's my daily existence. And I say, and I say me, but I mean, all people with disabilities face this. So I'm just gonna show you a, little, a few of my travel pictures just to let you know that even though I have a disability, it does not define me. It does not make me who I am. Only I can determine who I'm going to be. And as you heard um, my little introduction there, that's just a small piece of what I do. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. So I don't let my disability stop me. And so um, my first trip to Istanbul was in 2011. And this actually took a lot of planning for me. Um, or actually, I th well, it was the last thing on my bucket list to do. It's like I never had Istanbul on my, on my list of things to do. And I got a call from the World Dis Disability Union in Istanbul, and they said, would you like to come out and help us to see if we can get started on all of this? And I thought, yeah, okay, whatever. So I thought, well, okay, if I go, but Istanbul's an old city. How accessible is it? 
am I going to get anywhere? Like, am I going to be stuck at the airport? I mean, that's always my biggest fear, right? I travel, and it's like, okay, what's at the other end? Is there transportation to get me? Well, the person that was in charge promised me that there would be transportation waiting for me when I got there. I said, well, okay. So on a little faith, I had to go with what he said, because I don't speak, I don't speak Turkish, so I had to trust that they were going to do it properly for me, right? Because this is all through a translator. <laughs> Get that. Um, so I ended up flying 20, 22 hours from Edmonton to Istanbul. It's a very long trip. Now, can you imagine the planning that goes into that? It's like, okay. Okay, now I'm going to get a little personal. So um, to fly from here to Edmonton with that 22 hours, it's like, okay, there's a stop in... Where did we stop? Frankfurt? Yes, in Frankfurt, Germany. We stopped in Frankfurt. Now it's okay. So it's eight hours from Edmonton to Frankfurt, but we had to stop in Toronto first, right? So we stopped over in Toronto. I thought, okay, now I need to take a bathroom break. Got to make sure I get that in, right? Okay, so get that in because I'm sitting on the plane. I'm not leaving my seat for the next eight, 12 hours. Um, so it's like, okay, from Toronto to Frankfurt, that's six to eight hours of, in flight. So we finally get there and it's like, okay, find me a bathroom right now. So it's like, let's hope that there are accessible washrooms in the airports. Because sometimes, you know, there aren't. Um, but there was, thankfully, so we get there. So the eight hours there, so then we had six hour layover. And I planned my layovers because I don't want to be rushing from one plane to the next and not being able to, because we're always the last ones to deplane. And they don't always have a wheelchair for me at the gate um, when I get there, so I have to wait for it. And sometimes I've waited 20 minutes for one before they deplane <laughs> before they deplane me, and then I have to go through customs check and everything else, right? All of that stuff, like everybody else. So I make sure that I have enough time between changing planes. So there's that planning again. And then it's like, okay, six hours later, we get on that flight from there. It's only, thankfully, two and a half hours from there to Istanbul. I get there in the middle of the afternoon. I had actually left um, midnight in Edmonton, by the way. And I got there in the middle of the afternoon in Istanbul, and they are nine hours ahead of us at that point. So I finally get there and it's like, okay, let's hope that there is um, a vehicle waiting for us. Well, the first time I went there, the vehicle that they had, they had to lift me out of my wheelchair, plant me in the passenger seat, and then physically lift my chair into the back of the vehicle. And then I also had my sister and brother with me at the time, because I don't like to travel anywhere without anybody. Just, as always a just in case, so I had to plan with my companions too. So we get there. Get to the hotel, the guy's meeting us, and again through translators, he's greeting us, it's like, oh, great. Um, but I, hadn't got a, I haven't got a clue to what he's actually saying to me because the translator, her English wasn't all that good. <laughs> and of course, my Turkish was non-existent. So anyways, we finally get to the hotel room, um, but we're trying to sort things out there. And then set, six hours later, I have to get up to get ready. So I'm getting up three hours ahead of time, just to make sure, because I don't like new bathrooms and new situations, because that's a new routine that I have to live and create. <laughs> Let's start with this. Here we go. This is Istanbul, part of it, in part. It's a huge city. Um, that's the Bosphorus River that you see there. This was the World Disability Union organization that I had gone to meet with. There were, at this time, 44 countries representatives from 44 countries present. Um, he was showing me one of those little houses where you smoke those things. <laughs> I don't know what they are. Um, my brother is taking the picture, but he did try it, which is, I thought was rather funny, because he choked. <laughs> um, it was a very cold day. The week before, it was plus 20-something, and with the day we got there, it was snowing. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. Um, <laughs> I didn't have gloves, so I'm freezing. Um, so this was a train that we took from our hotel, which thankfully was only half a block away. Um, and this was the only transportation that I could take from the hotel down 
to the tourist um, to the tourist areas in Istanbul. This is actually our hotel. It's called the Wow Hotel. Don't know why. <laughs> it wasn't all that wow, let me tell you. <laughs> um, this is one of the mo more modern streets in Istanbul, so it was easy to get around in Istanbul for this. This is the Blue Mosque that we went to, so we were able to get around to this, but um, I couldn't actually get into, into the area, although we did discover the second year, that I, the second time I'd gone, that there was actually a ramp on the side of the building. Um, but even then, I couldn't get into the temple itself. I could just remain on the square, um, which is fine. So my brother and sister left me behind and went searching while I shivered in the cold. Um, anyway, this is the Hagia Sophia um, there as well, which was very, just basically across the street from the, there. And then we decided to do a, a ferry tour. Now this was very interesting. They wouldn't allow me to take my power chair, which was, which was this thing here that I took with me. They had to find me a manual chair. Um, and even then, it was a little scary because they had to lift me from that dock onto the boat. Um, and I'm like, oh, please don't drop me. Please don't drop me. I don't swim. <laughs> well, I do, like a rock, but there you go. <laughs> so I wasn't going to appreciate that much. So here I am. I made it on the boat alive. Um, and this was the bridge. People fished off the pier, or off the bridge, and just down below were all the restaurants. That was just the most bizarre thing to see, fish and things flying up from you when you're sitting outside. <laughs> And these are little restaurants on houseboats, or riverboats, rather. And there's um, that bridge is actually, it actually takes you from the um, European side to the Asian, to the Asian side um, across the Bosphorus, believe it or not. And the, uh, the European side is still, or sorry, the Asian side is still part of Istanbul. And that's where all the rich people live, by the way. Um, we actually took a, we actually rented a private car. Um, my friend had, all, had arranged it all, um, but even then it wasn't fully accessible. Both of us had to be lifted into the seat. And so we got to the other end, we had to lift it out of it and put it to our chairs, um, which was interesting to say the least. I won't go into there. Um, but anyway, at this square, we had gone to the spice market, um, which is right there. That's just a small sample. It smells so wonderful in there. Now here is the Grand Bazaar. This is back in Istanbul, um, the center. It was very interesting because my bro thankfully for my brother, we actually got into through this entrance here, and there's a huge 12-inch step down into the um, bazaar itself. We discovered later that there are actually other entrances that were level. <laughs> So he's been lifting me in and out, and nobody actually said a word to us and told us that that was the case. So here we are, there's over 2,000 shops in this place, and it's all covered. It's really nice. And here we are sitting by the river, shivering, drinking the inevitable apple tea. Um, it's just basically powdered fruit juice. <laughs> hot, but that's what it was, that's what they call it. I was just, I took a picture of the, the ground, um, because this is a lot of what I rolled over. I will tell you, my spine suffered. Now this is one of the rug places that I got dragged over to. You have to be very careful of the people there, because you don't know what they're up to. It says, oh no, come this way. That road? was very gentle compared to what I'd actually gone over to get to here. So we get to this market, or this store, and the rugs are actually down eight flights of stairs, or sorry, eight steps. Um, oh no, you wait right here, we'll bring you the carpets. Seriously? Um, oh yeah, have some apple tea while we go get you your carpets, right? <laughs> I'm drinking apple tea, it's a like, good thing there's bathrooms everywhere. Um, but <laughs> So you're drinking and drinking and drinking water or apple tea, but it's mostly apple tea. So here they are bringing up carpets to me for an hour. Of course, I didn't buy one, <laughs> but it's like, ah, they did it anyway. This was another um, tourist place that we'd gone to in Istanbul. 
What really surprised me, see the military men there with their Uzis or whatever those machine guns are? They um, had me a little worried. Um, so anyways, we got into here. Oh, by the way, that entrance wasn't accessible. Um, they actually put a wooden ramp into to get from the outside um, just into the doorway, and it was about a foot high. It was a little tricky. Um, and I encountered that actually all the way through. Some of the tourist places, there was actually at the Hagia Sophia back there, sorry, there was um, a one foot um, step to get over. So we got in there, but the thing is, they only had the, they only had the ramp on one side. The other side didn't have one. So thankfully, my brother was with me. He was able to um, lift my 300 pound chair, and that's without me in it, um, down the step and up the step and up and down all the curbs that we had to go through. Poor guy. It's a good thing, and he never complained. Um, so most of it was accessible, but there are certain places in here that I just could not get into. There are steps into this, um, temple or worship area within within that uh, uh, tourist site. And forgive me, I don't remember the names. Um, really bad with that. And here's a restaurant that we had gone to that was accessible. That's, that's one serving, by the way. Yeah. Um, and then I just thought I'd throw these in here. This is actually just outside of, in another city outside of um, Istanbul. And again, forgive me, I don't remember. But there's no way that access was ever around in the fourth century or, or the second century um, BC, 80, sorry. Um, this was a, an amphitheater. <laughs> that says it all. I have to tell you about that one. Um, <laughs> yeah, enjoy it. That's a library. Couldn't get into that one either if I wanted to. Now, my next thing I'm going to show you is that I've actually been to New York. I was at the United Nations um, doing a presentation. Anyways, this is Times Square, just a few pictures. Now, New York is actually very, very accessible with all the sidewalks. I didn't have any trouble getting up and down them. Um, our hotel was a, another issue altogether. I get a lot of people saying, oh no, um, our hotel is fully accessible. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I question that. Some of Central Park, we actually couldn't get into this area either. Um, some more pictures of Central Park. I actually went, I don't always wear shoes like that, just so you know. It's just that I had surgery on my foot when I traveled at that point. City, and I'm not sure where, how close it was to our hotel. I forget which direction I was going in. And then in Hawaii, just a little bit of that. To the beaches, which I could not go on to with this chair. Um, if I tried, I think I would still be there in quicksand. Um, actually, there was actually a walkway. They actually had paved walkways along the beaches, but you couldn't actually get onto them, which was like, okay. Sure, let me get some sand on, kick it onto the sidewalk, let's go. Um, yeah, you know, I had to throw that one in. <laughs> and I actually took a helicopter ride. Now what was interesting about the helicopter ride, um, they did actually make it accessible, as bizarre as it may seem. On the other side, which you can't see, they actually had a I don't know, it was kind of a strange kind of mechanical thing that they would, they'd actually have to transfer me out of my chair onto the seat, and then a mechanical thing would ride me up into the seat, closest to the passenger seat or wherever they were going to stick me, and then they would have to shove me across <laughs> to sit in the seat, and then they would strap me in. And just to prove I was actually in the helicopter, there you go. <laughs> um, and just other random pictures. And then now this is a CNIB in Calgary. Um, in 2000, we had a, I had actually had a part in designing this um, garden. And the whole idea behind this was to create it so that people that were um, visually impaired or blind could be able to find their way around and actually enjoy um, this little garden. And in 
each area actually has some slightly different um, things. And I'm sorry I don't have the pictures of them because I didn't take these pictures and I couldn't find mine. Um, anyway, it was originally it had asphalt on the ground and uh, it also had a gazebo, but they've actually redone it. Um, they redid it, but in each of the areas still, there should be an area that actually had um, aspen trees where the leaves would rustle in the wind so you could hear that. And then there were um, blackberry bushes, or sorry, blueberry bushes by the front door so that it would attract all the birds so you could hear the birds and enjoy the birds. Other areas had fountains. Um, other areas were just flowers so you could smell flowers all year round. There used to be um, herb gardens, so you can smell a different type of herbs, but I guess that wasn't kept up. Um, anyway, all year long, or sorry, all summer long to the fall, spring to fall, they were able to enjoy um, parts of this, and so they could, and they had the walkway so they could follow them um, around, and there were picnic areas here too. <laughs> this was the original. See the asphalt, the ugly asphalt. This was actually a project, um, a day of caring project, done in 2000 with the city of Calgary. Um, we had all of their city employees volunteer that day too, and they spent the whole entire day grading and digging and paving and whatever else. Not. It's an interesting day to say the least. Um, but I had a hat. I had a good hand in designing um, most of the design for for it, the walkways and everything, and what should, not exactly the plants that should go there, but we talked about what sort of things needed to go in and why they needed to be in those certain areas. And this is where I live. I just took a picture of the flower gardens, or sorry, the, yeah, our little planter boxes out front. So you can see that they're built up so that they could be enjoyed by people um, in wheelchairs. And we have a few areas where they could actually plant and get underneath the boxes and do their own gardening. And this is my office. See all the push buttons on the doors? Did that for me. Um, and then my desk, sorry, it's a really bad picture. The light was coming in from the other way. But the only thing on this that I wanted, and I don't know if you can tell, there's a little cutout on, in front of the, oh, in front of the telephone on this side. And there's a smaller cutout. This thing have a laser. Probably not. There's no laser on this, is there? No? Okay. Um, that's fine. Anyways, when I had started here, um, I said, oh, I need is just a slight accommodation so I could get my wheelchair closer and underneath the desk. Okay, I just want to, I just want to cut out. Oh, no, no, no. They sent me, um, uh, what do you call those people? Er 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 whatever you want. Okay, thank you. <laughs> They sent me one of those and said, oh no, we know exactly what you need. Sure you do. They raised my desk eight inches high. I thought, excuse me, now my nose is touching the desk. <laughs> I can't type this way. Are you trying to give me further problems, right? Shoulder, neck problems, everything else. Oh, but that's the only way to get your chair underneath. No, it's not. <laughs> I am telling you what I need. Oh no, no, you don't know what, it, you don't know what you're talking about. So anyways, it took six months for me to finally convince them that all they had to do was cut a, a half circle into my desk, right, into the desktop. That's all it took. I was like, oh, that's a smart solution. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> I think I should know what I need and what I don't need, right? So anyways, what I'm saying is that everything requires planning. So as you're out there, we want you to do thoughtful design and in taking into consideration our time, our energy, and if it's something if we really want to be doing. Um, I mean, I'm not likely to go skydiving or rock climbing, um, although there is someone that has or does. There are a few people that do actually do rock climbing from their wheelchairs, or not from their wheelchairs, but are paraplegic and can do that. Um, but I'm not likely to do so. But still, we need to make it barrier free. So, or accessible so that people can do the things that they need to do because our disabilities do not define us. Most of us would like and appreciate that. And so 
Disability is my lifestyle. It's not something to be pitied. I don't want your pity. I want you to think about what it is that I need or others like me might need or you yourself might need at some point. Right? But I've always thought that if you design it for a person with a disability, you design it for everybody. And that's what we call universal design. So I am a square peg trying to fit into a round hole, but do your best um, to allow me to be able to fit into that round hole, make it bigger or whatever the case is, but let's do something about it or, because I'm not going to round out my edges to fit your world. So thank you very much.